Uh, How do you want to do it? Not that Is that your water? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is this, um, I'm going to see Rory talking tomorrow. Are you? Yeah. yeah. Are you in your office or not? Okay, shall we start? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our panel dedicated to the migration challenge in Europe. Uh, my name is Loredana Teodorescu. I'm the EU Affairs Coordinator at Istituto Regis Turzo, which is an Italian member foundation of the Martin Center promoting this panel, and I will be moderating the debate. Uh, migration, we know, has been dominating national and European agendas in the last years, especially since 2015, uh, when the so-called refugee crisis started. Since then, many actions have been taken, the number of irregular migrants has decreased, but still uh, Europe is struggling to find an adequate and long-term response to the challenge. Uh, we still have uh, crucial questions on the table and dilemmas facing the policymakers. Uh, for instance, how to restore control of borders and contain irregular migration while protecting people in need. What about the humanitarian crisis? How to involve third countries and ensure their cooperation uh, on migration? Just to mention some of them. In the meantime, migration has also become a very sensitive topic, dividing EU member states and societies. And this, of course, makes it even more difficult to talk about realistic and viable and concrete solutions. So the aim of this panel today is to discuss about the current implications of uh, the migration challenge, but also possibly to debate concrete proposals in order to over overcome the challenges. And uh, we will do it together with our high-level uh, speakers of today. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, I will briefly introduce you uh, on my right. Uh, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Mr. Federico Soda. Uh, Federico Soda is the director of the IOM Coordination Office for the Mediterranean, which is based in Rome. And then on my left, uh, Roderick Parks, who is the senior analyst for the European Union Institute for Security Studies. And then next to him, François Bianfe, who is the liaison officer to the EU of the European Asylum Support Office. But first of all, let me... Uh, give the floor to uh, Mikula Zurinda, the president of the Martin Center and former Prime Minister of Slovakia, for his kickoff remarks. Mr. President, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Loredana. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your initiative. And uh, I am especially grateful, grateful to you because of choosing such a topical and challenging subject of our discussion, but I am very grateful also to all panel discussants. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being, being with us. And I am very grateful to everybody of you. I can imagine that the day is full and uh, you can be tired, but I believe that we have saved some energy also for this final stage of our today's agenda. So, when I listen a Central European, uh, the expression of migration, even though my country is not affected, I would say, maybe a bit reluctant when it comes to migration, I have full understanding for the fact that uh, 
migration as such contains a number of dimensions, I would say. When speaking or thinking about migration, immigration, I realize several dimensions of the challenge. I would maybe begin with a moral dimension of migration or immigration. But there is also something like philosophical, psychological, security dimension, but, but also economic dimension of the issue, also diplomatic dimension, and the best at the end, we have to speak about political dimension of this phenomenon. So allow, allow me to deliver a few remarks dedicated to every of these dimensions. Why is it moral? also very, very strongly moral issue. I mean that it is because we have to adopt sustainable and generally acceptable solution, which uh, must adhere to our values and principles. Values such as solidarity and responsibility. Solidarity with Joes who are oppressed by bullies and terrorists, who are refugees running away from, from war-torn areas. We have to promote our solidarity of those who are not affected by immigration with those who are in the front line. The countries such as Italy, Greece, the countries of Western Balkans, but also countries such as Lebanon or Jordan. On the other side, we should be also responsible and not to provide with the protection those who are not refugees, but want to misuse or abuse our generosity or our social systems. Why the question of immigration is also a philosophical one? by my mind, because it raises a question whether every EU country should provide its own sovereign asylum policy or whether asylum policy should be united or centralized, if you want, or promoted at the communitarian level. Maybe being even more concrete, maybe a bit provocative, I would ask, whether we should insist on so-called quota system as a durable, long-term principle, or just as a temporary approach for time of crisis? Or should we leave this model at all? It is, by my mind, also a very interesting question, especially in time of integration, in time of globalization. Why is it also a uh, psychological question? It is also a psychological question because massive immigration is related with concerns, not seldom with fears, especially in countries that have no or only a little experience with this phenomenon. We should not slam people who feel fear of unknown, or label them xenophobic. If we are not patient enough towards these people, they will seek a harbor among populists and extremists. I have to confess that I am nervous because of this new dichotomy to divide people on those who are migration lovers on one side, and to those who are xenophobic. I don't believe in the usefulness of such a dichotomy. Why is it a security issue? Because on one side, we have to refuse the narrative of far right that sus suspect every immigrant from terrorism. But on the other side, we cannot close our eyes before the reality 
that something has failed in the integration process of some immigrants as behind the Islamic terrorist attacks into EU cities is not seldom the second generation of migrants. Libya offers another, even though very gloomy, example. People from Africa trying to cross Libya to reach out the Mediterranean are captured by tribal Libyan militias, and then they are recruited or forced to join different jihadist groups. Libya has become a new incubator of terrorists that will cause further emigration, especially from Africa and the Middle East. So we are turning, we are spinning in, I would say, a vicious circle. Why is this phenomenon also e an economic issue? Because just it is very costly. Not only because of taking care of immigrants, but also with respect of wider relevant circumstances, such as a need to build refugee camps in relevant countries, humanitarian and development aid, the need to strengthen forces defending the EU external borders and other issues. Uh, I was reading recently an article showing that we have, for instance, Jordan, a country with 10 million inhabitants. The country has 1.3 million of refugees. And the cost serving this issue represents 1.5 billion euros on annual basis, which represents 4% of GDP of this country. Why it is also a diplomatic challenge? Because if we want to be successful and fair in this process, apart from other things, we have to be able to make a quick return of those people who are not qualified for being treated as refugees. But quick return requires several things. First of all, our ability to rightly identify safe countries to which it is possible to return these people. But it requires also a number of readmission agreements, readmission and repatriation agreements, and their implementation, which is even more difficult. And this is a role of our diplomatic service. And at the end, why migration, immigration, is also or mostly highly political issue. It is because we need to tackle the issue not only in our countries, but with, we also need to address the root causes of migration in all three dimensions of this phenomenon. It means we should deal with humanitarian aspect, with the development aid, and with security as such, especially related to our external borders, but also countries hit by war or terrorism. So it is highly political issue because it requires also a strong, courageous political leadership. In order to be successful, and to provide such strong political leadership. It requires also innovative ideas, visions, different alternatives of possible solutions, and last but not least, also concrete projects for particular areas of this problem. And I believe this is our ground, the ground of NGOs, the ground of civic society. This is why I welcome this panel discussion, believing that we are able to come up with such ideas, innovative visions, and at the end of the day, also with concrete proposals and incentives. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for your remarks and also your inspiring words. And uh, you touched upon a number of sensitive issues here, and uh, you highlighted very well the complexity of the migration challenge. And now I would like to deepen the discussion with our panel speakers, and I will turn to Federico Soda, uh, as IOM is playing a leading role in the management of the migration phenomenon, and is also working closer and closer with the European Union. So, Federico, can you give us an overview of the current situation, focusing mainly on the central Mediterranean route, and then uh, tell us also what uh, progress has been made and what are still the main challenges that we are facing nowadays? Thank sure. you. Sure, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to uh, the President. I think he's really put everything uh, on uh, that um, we'll be, uh, be picking up on in our comments. Um, let me start by saying that I think that um, we're in a long hangover uh, in Europe, long hangover period uh, following what occurred in uh, 2015 in particular, uh, when uh, more than a million migrants and refugees reached uh, the European Union, uh, mostly uh, from the Western Balkan route and the Central Mediterranean. And in fact, um, while we are still uh, very much in that uh, state of mind in, in many regards, uh, what's happened in subsequent years is um, really nothing like 2015. Uh, in 2016, uh, less than 400,000 um, irregular migrants were recorded across all of the southern uh, uh, Mediterranean borders and in 2017, about 180,000. Now, um, I think we could uh, debate for a long time about whether a million in 2015 was an emergency or a crisis or not, but I would hope that we can all agree that a, a few hundred thousand people, given uh, Europe's geographic location, given uh, what is happening uh, all the way from the bulge of Western Africa to uh, Central Asia with various conflicts and other types of crises, we shouldn't be surprised that um, Europe is required to uh, face uh, and deal and address uh, this type of challenge. And indeed, I think that uh, right now we're dealing with the southern borders, but um, really it could easily be the eastern flange uh, sometime down the road or, or some of the other uh, external, uh, external uh, borders. Um, most arrivals in 2017 and in 2018 have been through the central Mediterranean route, um, which is, it's a very fluid and a very complicated uh, migration. Uh, and and um, the president talked about um, returns and readmissions. We hear a lot about this. It's a fundamental part of migration management, but the reality is that every year about 60 different nationalities are registered at Italian ports. Um, if you take the top five, you can account for maybe 40%, and after that it's a long list of countries with whom we have, certainly Italy has very limited or perhaps even non-existent bilateral uh, collaboration on migration on, and many other European countries also don't. We're talking about a geographic area of origin from Senegal to the Comoros Islands to uh, Bangladesh, which greatly complicates the bilateral and even the multilateral uh, discussion. We also have a very, very complicated and fluid situation in Libya. Um, I think that We've been uh, maybe, I think the numbers have been encouraging in terms of the registrations in Italy and the, the arrivals in Europe in the, in the last months. But really, if we look at the number of people that left Libya last year, we're probably somewhere in the 140, 145,000, while 120,000 were, were managed to be rescued and, and, and brought back to, uh, to Italy. And this year, um, we're seeing I think some concerning developments in the south where peace agreements are very, very fragile, maybe not holding. 
and also developments in the recent developments in the East, which nobody knows how they will unfold, but are certainly not uh, creating more stability and, 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 or, or prosperity in that region. Our estimates continue to be that there are about 700,000 migrants uh, in Libya. That includes, <clears throat> that includes about 50,000 um, that UNHCR has, has um, recognized as being entitled to international protection. But we should by no means think that this is a cohort that is all trying to reach Europe. We have about uh, up to 20% of that group constitutes Egyptian nationals, which we see in relatively no, no numbers coming across. We also have a lot of nationals from Niger, which really we don't see at all uh, registered in Italy. And a lot of intra-regional migration of people that are not looking to cross uh, the Mediterranean. So I think this is an important um, this is always important to keep in mind whenever we, we hear data and numbers about what is happening in Libya. I think it is, it is a myth and I think it's incorrect uh, to suggest that uh, everybody is bound for Libya to get to Europe and everybody in Libya is trying to reach uh, the European Union. I think if that were the case, we would see a lot more pressure on, on the southern borders in general. The fact is that most people coming across are leaving because they find themselves in the north stuck in situations and conditions that are either very, very dangerous or totally unacceptable for other reasons related to exploitation and abuse and, and coming across in the absence of alternatives to return sustainably with, with assistance and we, with reintegration is, is one of the options and perhaps the only option for many. Of course, the perception has been rightly, I think, uh, in Europe that the situation has been uh, chaotic and mismanaged and out of control. I think the images, the regular images in the news about overloaded boats and, and sinking boats and chaos at the borders and, and queues of people trying to cross uh, certain points are going to create uh, that impression. Um, but. And the reality is that in this context, I think we have to do much more in uh, really informing the discussion about the fact that this is not something that we're going to be able to find a short-term fix to, but that it is a long-term phenomenon that is going to be with us for some years, some uh, decades, for many of the reasons that have already men been mentioned in the initial, initial remarks. A lot of emphasis has been put on externalizing the issue by the European Union, uh, doing more work uh, upstream. I certainly uh, think there's a lot more that we can do uh, in countries of origin and in countries of transit, including on, uh, on uh, better management and better controls. But um, we also have to be aware that uh, these types of uh, interventions have consequences. In Niger, for example, Niger has been very, very collaborative with uh, European policies in, in uh, basically clamping down on, um, on smugglers and traffickers and, and people that facilitate these kinds of movements. People have been arrested, groups have been dismantled, uh, but now the, the problem is that there are no alternatives uh, for a lot of these communities. What they were doing informally has been taken away from them without substitutes and in, in contexts that are already fragile and, and uh, susceptible to, uh, to external uh, influences, I think we have to be very, very careful uh, in when and how uh, we intervene and, 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 and think of, of, the, of the consequences um, as well. For sure, security alone is not going to be uh, the way uh, out, of this, uh, out, of this, uh, out of this situation. I think that to get past the only security discussion, I'm going to move on now a little bit to some of the, some of the challenges and some of the areas. I think, well, first of all, um, progress has been made in the last uh, few years, I think, in fact, and a lot of progress has been made more generally, globally, on 
discussions about migration governance in the last 10 to 15 years. So even though sometimes it looks like we're standing still or even going backwards, I don't believe that uh, to be the case at all. I do think that to, be, to get to more balanced, sustainable and durable policies, we do need to have a clear um, approach Europe-wide. Um, we have a totally unequal distribution of uh, migrants and refugees uh, in Europe, uh, disproportionately present in countries like France, Italy, Germany, uh, and Sweden, which I think also uh, it contributes to this, this, these uh, distorted perceptions uh, that, that m m much of the public has. Um, and I think that, inf indeed, we are confronted with all these challenges because migration and asylum policies is an, is an, is an uncompleted part of um, the, Euro European, uh, the European project. And so we find ourselves trying to complete this part of the project um, in a way with, uh, with uh, a gun to our head. Um, the challenges in the Mediterranean are also very real. We continue to have major challenges, uh, both with um, the types of crossings that are made in the sense that although the numbers are down, the fatalities are higher than ever proportionally. So crossing the Mediterranean now is as dangerous as ever. This is because, I think this is because of an absence of a state-led solution to uh, reducing loss of life, which then brings in the role of uh, civil society who um, unfortunately, I think, um, have been become a target in uh, in in this uh, in this situation, and um, and that has had very negative consequences. And I don't want to talk specifically about those the operations, but on the fact that civil society has been attacked and discredited uh, by uh, authorities, which. I think in the in in, in European uh, in European government in European states and in, Euro in European democracies, this is this is a concerning trend. So, we do need to be also mindful of the fact that when we're talking about controls and and stopping people, the situations uh, in the, these countries and in Libya in particular are very very difficult and very uh, uh, dangerous and we're a long way from any kind of resolution that's going to uh, to, to uh, create um, acceptable uh, conditions uh, there so that's an area that requires uh, further interaction further work I think that um, definitely the dialogue with um, the countries of origin and countries of transit also needs to uh, be more uh, balanced because while I think that the um, end result, uh, the, the desire is for the end result is that um, there be better governance and, and more prosperities in these countries, uh, the motive really to do it is, that so, is so that they will not come to our countries. And um, that may or may not be the end result but I would hope that if we're working for better governance, better health, better education, better economies, better trade uh, in other regions and with other countries, uh, we're not doing it uh, only to ensure that uh, we have fee f less mobility and fewer people coming to our countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this broad overview and this big, big picture you gave us. And. Um, Yes, so we have a drop of numbers, but still the situation is complicated, as you highlighted. Uh, you mentioned lots of, uh, lots of elements, uh, like the lack of cooperation of third countries, but also the need to address the consequences of our cooperation, the instability, of course, of our neighborhood, uh, the gap between the perception and the reality, which also the President Zurinda addressed. And uh, you mentioned also the need for a Europe-wide approach, since some frontline member states are particularly under pressure. And here I would like to turn to François Bianfé, who is the representative of the European Asylum Support Office, uh, because EASO is playing uh, uh, an important role in supporting the member states and has increased its activities in the frontline uh, member states, as Italy. 
So I'd like to ask you uh, if you can tell us more about your role, about how you are supporting the member states and what are the results of this cooperation. Thank you, Francois. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting EASO here and as well for the very interesting discussions or an inspiring introduction by mm -hmm. the president. So, uh, before I really uh, go to EASO, I, I will give some more general elements at the EU level because EASO is part of the EU response, of course. And so, well, as it was already mentioned, there was in 2015 to 2016 uh, this specific moment where uh, Europe faced a sudden increase in the number of arrivals. We don't know if we need to call it a crisis or not. That's really a question for, for debate. But it was a fact that there was an increase. And what happened is that in the number of people arriving, some were migrants, and migrants were probably the conclusion is or should be that they should return uh, in the country they are from. But other people were uh, persons needing protection, uh, people needing international protection, like refu refugee, or maybe people needing to be protected by civil protection, but as well uh, vulnerable persons, victims of trafficking, torture, rape, or ser serious forms of violence. And as well, of course, uh, unaccompanied children, women at risk, and other categories of vulnerable person. And that's really one of the big challenges. It's how to make the distinction and how to make that distinction at the same time quick enough because we cannot be too long in the process, but we need to do it properly so we cannot be too quick because then we make more mistakes as well at that moment. And so that situation <clears throat> put some of the member states' asylum and reception capacities uh, under big pressure. And it put, as well, the common European asylum system under pressure. So the EU tried to respond to uh, measures, and in particular, uh, there has been what is called the European Agenda in migration, on Migration, which includes uh, new concepts, like the hotspot approach, and I will mo go more in detail in there, but as well another concept like the reloc relocation scheme. So let's start with the objective of the hotspot approach that was to ensure that by putting at the same place different organizations like European organizations, but international organizations and the national uh, administrations as well at the same place, uh, we would have a more coordinated system uh, to ensure that the persons would be swiftly identified, registered and fingerprinted allowing for rapid referral to asylum procedures for those in need of international protection, and as well for coordinated efforts on returns for the persons who wouldn't need that international protection. And I go already to one of the conclusions, if I can say. Uh, I think one of the big improvements, and it was mentioned before, uh, in those last years, that at this moment in Europe, by Greece or by Italy, the persons who arrive on the territory of uh, the EU are registered. That's a very, almost 100% of those persons are registered. And that's a big improvement because if you go three years back, that was certainly not the case. And I think it's very reassuring on many aspects and to have a more mature and maybe a less passionate approach on what's happening, having clear figures, but at least we know them. And then the other concept was the relocation of uh, persons in clear need of international protection. The idea was that uh, some uh, countries, like Italy, Greece, being at the external border of the EU, were receiving a much higher number and proportion of uh, migrants than other uh, countries in the EU. And so the idea was to help those two countries by allowing that a certain number of the migrants, and in reality, more than migrants, persons who could be identified as probably refugees, I'm saying probably because the examination was not done at the spot, there was a kind of presumption, presumption by the nationality, there were people of nationalities for which the recognition rate in the EU at that time was above 75 persons, so it's a kind of presumption, uh, that a certain number of those people should be relocated in other member states. And that's what happened, we can speak about figures later, uh, and about what was the initial target, but what I can say is that this program 
Seten would say it's a failure. I wouldn't say that because it has never happened before that there has been like 22,000 persons relocated from Greece to other EU member states and about 12,000 persons from Italy to other EU member states. Now, yes, and another very important step before Eric go more like specifically on ESO is the uh, EU-Turkey statement of uh, March 2016. And again, we can speak a lot about the statement, but what we need to see is that it had a big impact on the situation there. Before the EU-Turkey statement, there were some days with some 10,000 persons crossing the agency and arriving from Turkey to a Greek island. And now the average number of persons crossing the sea is around 100 a day. So from 10,000 sometimes to now an average of 100 a day. So what is the ESO response in this context? ESO had been established before the crisis in 2010. Uh, but since 2015, ESO was tasked specifically uh, with some operations to really help and be part of a possible solution to address the crisis. And so ESO developed uh, its operations, and in particular, again, in those two countries, in Greece and in, in Italy. I will speak very shortly about Greece and a bit more about Italy. Uh, not because it's less interesting about Greece, but I think for the discussion here today. Uh, in Greece, ESO is part of the hotspot system there. We, we deploy experts to help the Greek asylum service to make the decisions in the context of the EU-Turkey statement, meaning we help the Greek asylum service in deciding if the person, the migrant, can be considered as admissible or not admissible on the EU territory. So we are there for this specific function, and we are there as well because it went further, the mandate of EASO helping the Greek asylum service. Now our teams are even helping uh, the Greek authorities in preparing the files to make decisions on eligibility. Eligibility meaning the examination on the merits of the asylum claims. When I say the teams, that means member states, experts, which are deployed under EASO umbrella. But that is as well locally recruited experts which are trained by EASO to help as well to have uh, bigger teams, again, to support the Greek asylum service. Now, about Italy, um, well, we had a role on relocation. So in relocation, the idea was to inform the, the migrants arriving in Italy and co coordinating those efforts of information and as well helping the Greek authorities to register uh, those persons and then seeing if it's possible to organize the transfer for people to be relocated in the rest of the EU. I will not speak longer about relocation because the program is really finishing now. Uh, but again, I think it was a very interesting experience. And then uh, other operations that EASO are doing and activities in Italy, those activities are based on specific operating plans with, which are co-signed by Italy and, and EASO. I will not go too far in the past to tell you what we've done. I think we'll just focus about what we aim to do now in 2018. You can find the operating plan between uh, EASO and Italy on the website of EASO, like a lot of other information, you, you will find it there. <coughs> and in a, few, in a few words, what we do there is really support the Italian authorities, again, in giving information. And there, the issue of the hotspots is interesting, but it's very different in Italy and in Greece. Because in Greece, we can say all the, all the big, big, big majority of the new migrants arrive in, in those hotspots on the Greek islands. I know that not some arrive through the Evros region, but the big majority in the Greek islands. In Italy, you have hotspots, but the situation is more complicated in terms of geography. And so a lot of boats uh, are landing in other places than specifically the hotspots. So that's already a challenge that we face there is to see how we can be efficient when those boats disembark people in places which are not specifically the hotspots. So that's why it's important to have people very well spread, very flexible, moving to give the information, because the information is key. It's very important for the persons when they arrive, as I said before, to be 
correctly registered, fingerprinted, but as well to receive the information on what to do next, if it makes sense or not for them to apply for international protection, for instance, or if uh, they are vulnerable, they need to be detected, like children or other persons under the vulnerability conditions need to be detected very soon. That's why it's very important to, to have this first contact as soon as possible. Then we support as well the, uh, the Italian authorities with the registration. It's an administrative work, but really to introduce all the data in the system. And since there have been those last years a, a big number of persons arriving, there is a, a backlog uh, in Italy at this moment, but the backlog, uh, I think, is diminishing at this moment, and we really support the Greek authorities to address that, and as well we try to help them to do it uh, very efficiently. Then, in other practical measures, we help as well uh, the, the commissions who will make themselves the work of deciding who needs international protection or not. In Italy, we are not involved so deeply as we are in Greece, helping them to make those decisions, but let's say that we're involved in preparing and then after this decision as well on technical uh, operations. And I will finish because I don't want to be too long at this moment with this. Uh, we help as well the, the Greek authorities, uh, the, sorry, the Italian authorities uh, in dealing with uh, the unaccompanied minors because quite a high proportion of the, the persons who arrive in Italy are uh, unaccompanied minors and some important measures were taken last year. There was a, a law in 2017 in Italy which was very important. There is a number of persons for uh, the children and the <clears throat> the young uh, persons uh, in Italy, and we help uh, in the system to try to find sufficient guardians who can take care of those children, and as well globally uh, to, to has assist the system in terms of uh, improving the, the way that the accommodation takes place, the, the, the personnel who's involved with this public, etc. I could say a word, but I will keep it for later, on, on what are the possible plans uh, about the agencies, so at this moment we are the uh, asylum support office. Normally, we should become, and we hope as soon as possible, the EU asylum agency, and that would uh, give us uh, some additional and I think important tasks as well to address different challenges. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up quickly on what you said <coughs> because you are running lots of activities also in frontline member states. But do you think that your work is visible enough? Because if you talk to I don't know, to Italian citizens, they always claim that the European Union is not doing enough to support, uh, to support Italy, no? And, uh, but still, you are there, you are doing lots of activities. It's true that um, <clears throat> it's not always very visible. For instance, in the new measures and with the new Italian law, the Italian authorities recruit 250 new staff to proceed the asylum cases. But we will really train very intensively those 250 new staff members mm -hmm. to make sure that they are well trained, that they have the good basis to make the right decisions. And again, it's not very visible, but I think it's very important because if we of don't course. do it, then it, the system fails later. Mm -hmm. So yes, maybe there was a question of visibility. And again, be more in Italy than in Greece. In Greece, we've been involved mm -hmm. uh, earlier in an important role, which I think is more visible for the good and for the less good, because since we are more involved in the Greek system than what we are in the Italian one, uh, we are as well more reproached when we are considered not to do the right thing. <laughs> but that's part of the, the responsibility. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Francois. And thank you for this insight, which allowed us also to deal about the asylum policy. And here again, we have some controversial issues like the relocation process, the quota system. And we know that we are discussing in these days also the Dublin regulation. And here again, we have uh, a division uh, within, within Europe. So thank you very much. And now I'd like to move outside the EU borders. We mentioned already how important it is to cooperate with third countries, with countries of origins and transit of migration flows. And uh, indeed, while the EU member states are divided about migration and asylum policy at home, usually they tend to agree that, uh, on the fact that we need to cooperate more 
uh, on migration with uh, other countries, especially now in Africa. And here we have many, many questions like how to ensure the cooperation of third countries on migration, which kind of incentives we can use or we should use, and on which aspects should the cooperation be focused. Uh, Roderick, your research is centered on the link between migration and foreign affairs, and you also recently wrote a paper on the topic on uh, the EU cooperation with uh, African countries. So I'd like to ask you if you could outline some of the main findings of your research. Yes, I will do. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll start by, um, by apologizing for my English. I am English. That doesn't mean to say that you'll understand me. Um, so <laughs> if my accent is too strong, is say so. Problem, no? <laughs> yeah, Francois, you always look like you're concentrating very hard when I speak English. So, right, okay, there we are, you see. Um, <laughs> Uh, you're, you're, you're welcome to say you don't understand unless you're American, and then I think I would be cross. Um, what, what I want to do, I hope this isn't too abstract, what I want to do is give a sort of overall picture of how European foreign policy has changed um, before, during, and after the migration crisis. Um, what, what I'm going to do is sort of base this on the, the mental map of of homo eurocratus, the, the European diplomat sitting in, in the external action service, and, and try to show how, how that's altered over the course of, of the last few years. So I'll start with, with the sort of mental map of, of the Eurocrat before the crisis. If you talk to any diplomat and said, how do you picture the EU in the world, they would almost certainly talk about concentric circles. They would sort of picture the EU at the center of the world, radiating out order and influence to further circles or concentric circles of countries, to the enlargement countries in the southeast, then to the neighborhood countries in the south and the east, and then to a sort of outer ring of countries where we have development relations. Um, and that, I think, was the same in our approach to migration. If you, if you ask them, what is the EU's approach to migration? They would say, our aim is to abolish it. And they don't mean in terms of sort of creating fortress Europe. What they were talking about is having deep reforms in ever greater circles of member states, gradually lifting borders and controls to these countries. And instead of having large scale migration, you would have mobility. So people moving back and forth between countries without being stuck by sort of disparities in pull and push factors. Um, and I think they would say something similar about asylum and refugee flows. What's your aim? It is to abolish um, refugee flows. Um, gradually, uh, it can be turning transit countries into reception countries, um, pacifying spaces where people are fleeing and eventually, hopefully, spreading democracy and wealth to other bits of the world so that you don't have refugee flows. So that's the sort of mental picture of, of the Eurocrat, I think, this idea of, of concentric circles and us radiating order outwards. And that, and that pertains not just to overall European foreign policy, it's also to migration and to asylum. Um, during the crisis, how was that challenged? Well, I, I would sort of take the, the crisis back before 2015, um, uh, may, maybe a little bit to the sort of financial crisis, because you're already seeing that very orderly idea of concentric circles challenged by the growth of irregular migration flows out of West Africa, out of the Horn of Africa, out of the Balkans. Um, and instead of reforming these, these countries, what we did increasingly was create buffers a deal between Spain and Morocco cuts off the flow of, of people coming out of um, West Africa. Um, barriers and fences put up by Israel, Saudi Arabia, cut off the flow of people coming from, from Eritrea, Ethiopia, and so on. And a set of tight returns deals between the EU and Western Balkan countries cuts off that flow as well. Um, what you see from about 2012 onwards is a further collapse in that sort of system. Um, the situation in Libya deteriorates, so the flows out of West Africa and the Horn of Africa divert through Libya, through the central Mediterranean. 
um, Syria um, collapses inside the perimeter fence built by Israel and Saudi Arabia, and the people coming out of Syria link into the, the sort of smuggling networks created for people coming out of the Balkans and come into, into Sweden and, and Germany. Um, picture the mental map of your orderly circles now, and it's changed. Instead of circles, you're dealing with flows, flows linking up tricky sets of countries. Egypt, Sudan, <coughs> Ethiopia, Eritrea. Um, countries with whom we don't have formats to deal with that. We have neighborhood formats to deal with circles of states. We don't have diplomatic formats to deal with strings of states like that. Often strings which, which may line up with um, other sources of discontent, the Nile waters, for example. So we find ourselves being tugged into that. And countries on routes which have diplomatic problems with each other and say, well, we, Sudan, may hold back the flow of people into Europe, but in return for that, we would like your support for this geopolitical issue. So flows instead of circles. Secondly, blank spots that we'd ignored in the past, Libya, Syria, Eritrea, because the fallout from the regimes in these countries never really hit us, suddenly become burning hot spots. So again, the, the map has changed. Um, thirdly, insofar as we do have the idea of circles still, it's an inner ring of, of buffering states, those countries where through accession negotiations, through neighborhood policy, we have the greatest leverage. And instead of trying to push for reforms there, we can just say, hold back the flow of people. And then an outer ring of countries where we have looser development relations, which, which simply becomes disorderly. And we feel that we have... Um, no impact. And the fourth shift, I think, and something that, that Federico sort of hinted at, is, is the breakdown in the attempt at parity between East and South, that suddenly the focus, the focus shifts much further to the South and the East for whatever reason, but is seen as, as less problematic. So that's sort of the mental map during the crisis. It's completely shifted away from this orderly sort of concentric circles. Almost done, after the crisis. What does the mental map look like now? Um, if I talk to my colleagues again, homo eurocratus in the external action service, instead of concentric circles, they talk about pools, flows, and bridges. Um, what do they mean by that? By the pools, they, they picture the EU not at the sort of center of the world radiating out order, but they have a sort of map of the world that's, that's with polka dots. We are just one regional block, and our goal is to try to create regional labor markets abroad. Um, the germ of that idea, I think, comes from ECOWAS in, in, in West Africa, where they've explicitly said to us, you know, we want to create a sort of regional labor market along European lines. Um, but I think IOM will, will be able to articulate some of the disappointment that we feel with, with ECOWAS, which is a sort of free movement zone de facto, rather than because it's nicely regulated. Actually, I think that the, the more hopeful bit of the world when it comes to regional cooperation, funnily enough, is the Horn of Africa. There's, there's you know, part of the world that is deeply split, as I, as I mentioned, but where actually we are seeing signs that they, that they want to cooperate within EGAD, the regional group there, and for strange reasons as well. Um, that the countries on the migration flow who were involved in the cartoon process went from Djibouti down to Tunisia. Um, and we found that actually that was quite a useful string of countries to help build regional cooperation in the Horn. Djibouti benefits from having French-speaking Tunisia give them policies that that they can implement. Um, Uganda is involved on that route as well. Uganda ranks as a as a sort of you know regional leader on on refugee reception. Wasn't really involved in EGAD before, but now is. Um, and the second thing I think that was useful for us 
was that when we started talking to the countries of the Horn and said, you know, hello, Ethiopia, um, we're going to do our usual thing of offering you slightly more options for your citizens to come to the European Union, and in return, we'd like you to do X, Y, Z. They said, we're not interested in the EU as a labor market. What we want is European support to open up the Gulf labor markets and the GCC. So suddenly, we, we started seeing that you know, the EU is not the center of the world. You can create a regional labor market in the Horn of Africa, and you can cooperate with EGAD in order to deepen the labor market in the GCC. So that's the idea of pools. Uh, the flows a little bit, um, I think, also comes from, from dealing with, with Djibouti and uh, the Horn of Africa and seeing what the Chinese are doing there with their narrative on, on One Belt, One Road and managing flows, in a, you know, economic flows in a, in a better way. Um, one shift, I think, is, is to look at the real course of migration flows and see that they're not heading for Europe in large numbers. They're heading for other bits of the world. At the beginning of the crisis, we, we cut development aid to South Africa at just the point where it needed help with dealing with immigration. Suddenly, we've started looking at migration flows away from Europe as well. How can we support these? And then broader economic flows. How do we get the, you know, Chinese investments in Africa better regulated through things like the European investment? Um, trust and so on. So that's the idea of flow, sorry, and I will finish. And the third idea is the idea of bridges, bridging states. Our Morocco, the US is Mexico. Countries that, that sit between the global north and traditional migration receiving blocks and other bits of the world that are becoming richer and more attractive. We look at Morocco it's trying to use migration to build, uh, trying to use migration to build relations with ECOWAS, um, with its southern neighbours, because it wants to diversify its markets, because it wants to build relations with its southern neighbours. And there's a risk that we in Europe look at what Morocco is doing and say, "Oh, great, you're you're becoming a a country of reception. You know, we'll put up the barriers." In actual fact, like Mexico, they're playing a very difficult balancing act between north and south. And the real challenge, you know, if I talk to my colleagues, is to manage these sort of bridging states that, that fit between the polka dots um, and are playing a very difficult game. Um, so one last sentence, if I may. Of course. I think the, you know, if the mental map of the Eurocrats has, has changed away from the concentric circles to the sort of polka dots connected up with bridging states. Um, also, the underlying sense of panic that we had in the crisis has dissipated a little bit. I think during the crisis, we still perceived ourselves as sort of at the center of the world. Everyone was heading towards us, and we had no means to stop it. I think if I now talk to, to colleagues about migration, they would say, we think of migration a little bit as a red herring. It's always a symptom of deeper geopolitical and geoeconomic changes. Um, and those changes, to a degree, are, are hopeful. Wealth is spreading. That may have some... You know, and it's, you know, if you look at global, you're looking skeptical, so that's why I focus on you. You know, it's not just that, we're, that, that Europe is becoming relatively poorer compared to the rest of the world, but, but wealth is spreading abroad. Other, other bits of the world are becoming wealthier. That can have negative implications. It can lead to power shifts. It can lead to greater family sizes as people are able to afford more children. It can lead to a growth in migration um, as people are able to travel. But it does also mean that other parts of the world are becoming more attractive they're not all heading here. And if we can help build up the kind of migration governance regimes that Federica was, was sort of um, talking about before, then there is a, a means potentially of, of harnessing those more hopeful underlying trends rather than focusing on the sort of apocalyptic. I'll stop. Sorry, that was too long as well. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much for this broad <laughs> picture and overview about the the foreign relations and how the European Union is trying to cooperate with, uh, with other countries. And of course, as you said, other parts of the world are in the meantime becoming attracting. So somehow also the migration flows towards Europe will, uh, will probably change. Um, okay, now before turning to the, to the audience for the Q&A session, I would like just to 
take a step forward and start talking about concrete answers or how to turn the challenges into opportunities. So I would like to ask uh, all of you um, a quick question, uh, but a tough one. <laughs> Uh, so, if you had to highlight two main aspects we should really focus on to answer the current challenges, uh, which aspects would you choose? So, you can mention two lessons learned or two concrete proposals in order to move a little bit forward in the discussion. Uh, please be short, let's say two minutes. Who wants to start? So, it's a tough question and I'm making it even tougher. <laughs> Francois? I can start. There will be one positive measure that I think the EU should take, and there is one I think the EU should not. Okay. So the one that the EU should take is to adopt the common European Asylum system measures, which are now normally more or less ready for adoption, including the Dublin regulation. We know discussions are very tough. There are other regulations, and there is uh, as well the establishment of the EU asylum agency, which would give us more means to really address those difficulties. We would have more possibilities to operate, more staff, and as well more possibilities of control on different aspects. I will not enter into detail now. I'm ready to answer questions if they are. Now, the thing I, I believe that the EU should avoid, and the member states in particular, is to disengage on many aspects because they would consider that the crisis is over. And that's something that we see quite regularly, uh, is to believe, okay, now let's talk about something else and we forget about the measures that we're going to take when there was a crisis. So I would really strongly suggest not to dismantle uh, the benefit of things which have been put in place, sometimes with difficulties, but which start working. I was mentioning relocation. I know it's a, it's a very sensitive topic, but I don't believe that everything should be uh, forgotten from that experience. The hotspots and the way to share capacities between member states to address the situation where there are crises, I think it would be a mistake to dismantle them. The same, it would be a mistake to diminish the reception centers because there is a diminution in numbers of arrivals, because we must not forget that we need at the same time to organize legal pathways and those same centers could be used, for instance, for resettlement. And my last example is about uh, the staff, the staff which is recruited in the different administrations of the member states when there is a big need because of the high influxes. This staff gains experience, is trained, becomes very good in a job, and then the usual uh, practice is to fire them when we don't need them because the figures go down. But about migration, and that's uh, historic data. The next crisis, maybe it's not tomorrow, but it's probably for the day after tomorrow. So in my opinion, that would be a mistake to dismantle all the system. It's better to invest and keep it at a level uh, for efficiency. Okay, thank you very much. Federico? Uh, yeah, I think that um, my first one would be, uh, first priority would be integration. I think we have to be, um, very cognizant of the fact that a lot of people that are in Europe t already uh, will be staying here, um, either because they will have a right to or because it will not be possible for them to return home. And integration requires a really much more holistic approach than we currently have. I think we need to do a lot more with the host societies. I think we need to do a lot more in schools, in the education systems. I mean, um, this migration is going to be with the next generations, whether we think it's a good thing or not. Um, and so I think a lot of work needs to be done with um, the resident communities, as well, of course, as with the migrant communities, civic education and rights and obligations and all those issues. And then, of course, um, very much on labor market integration as well, because you have successful integration when people are productive members of uh, society. Um, we have some examples of situations that have, uh, I think, not been handled well uh, in Europe uh, in relation to past migration, where people c are marginalized and excluded after generations, and we, s we certainly can't afford to repeat those uh, mistakes again. The second point, um, 
is, you know, I talked about the effort to control these flows, and I think for reasons related to security, to order, to the very basic uh, sovereign right of states uh, to control who enters for how long and, and for what purpose, very important. But we also have to, um, I think, in a way, dose that with the reality, uh, demographic realities, economic realities, and uh, put uh, legal channels on the list of priorities as well. And that's legal channels for people that are entitled to protection, for people that are coming for economic reasons. It can be temporary, it can be permanent, but it should be safe, orderly, and done in a way that also meets the needs of uh, labor markets, which exist. So I think this is pretty much completely missing from many pictures, not all of the pictures in the European member states, but many pictures. So uh, a bit more equilibrium, and also a lot of consideration about, uh, about those that are already here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. Roderick, the last one. Right, I, I, I'd, I'd say two things, hopefully not too broad, but, but one picks up on, on where mm -hmm. I left off. Um, as, as the rest of the world does get wealthier, even if you're skeptical, we are seeing that, that, tra that traditional distinctions between sending countries and receiving countries are narrowing. So, um, on a global level, that allows us to, to put pressure on countries, often countries that have taken a very sort of pro-migration line, like Morocco, like Mexico, um, and say, actually, your secret agenda is not so pro-migration anymore. You're looking at the same problems that we are in terms of migration control, in terms of controlling your southern borders, in terms of returns, et cetera, et cetera. So to understand that shift, but to understand that we also increasingly will be an area of emigration. If I talk to young Europeans now, they find these debates absurd. Why are governments in Europe obsessed with keeping people out? One of the things that they want is actually the same as, as Ethiopia said it wants. You know, find us opportunities abroad. Perceive that we are also migrants and perhaps the opportunities aren't within Europe. Look for opportunities abroad. So, you know, that's my, that's my first thing, I think, is perceive that, you know, that the shift has, has taken place between, you know, the distinction between sending and receiving countries. Um, and that gives us allies abroad in terms of taking a sort of sensible approach to migration, a more balanced approach, but also looking abroad for the good treatment of migrants, because our citizens will be migrants. That's the first thing. The second thing, I think, we had a lot of very rosy notions in, in the past about you know, migration and triple wins and this sort of stuff, circular migration, visa liberalization and so on. Um, and in the course of the crisis, yeah, it, you know, everything soured a little bit. But I think maybe a couple of years on, it's possible to take these concepts again and, and tweak them a little bit so that they do work properly. I mean, this is a little bit hawkish, but if we're looking at visa liberalization, think also a little bit about diplomatic visas. Um, uh, if you regulate the treatment of people who hold diplomatic visas, in our partner countries, then you have immediate political leverage in a way that a lot of governments don't necessarily care about getting visa liberalization for their citizens. They care about themselves and their families. So if you add a sort of diplomatic visa element into visa liberalization and tweak it, um, you'll probably see immediate political leverage in some tricky countries. Um, uh, I think that's worth putting in equally circular migration. We had a, a, a grand idea about sort of triple wins that that the EU would win from from people coming and going and, and third countries would and so on. And it, it hasn't worked. But there's an, there's an awful lot of scope, I think, in, in again, tweaking that. Um, work with, with multinational corporations so that it becomes part of their social corporate responsibility to be transferring people into Europe and then out again, rather than just hoping that this sort of wonderful triple win process will work. You know, re reach out to, to other people. Um, 
start regulating a little bit migration within trade and services to, to again take advantage of that. You've got a parallel legal regime that you can deal with there. Um, so I think that's that's the second thing. Don't don't throw away all the concepts that we had, which looked a little bit rosy during the, the crisis, but add maybe a sharper edge to them or pull in a different set of players and you'll find that it's that it becomes feasible. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting some priorities. This is very useful also for our reflection. And now I would like to open the floor to the audience. Uh, please state your name and organization when asking a question. And if you are addressing a specific speaker, please uh, say so at the beginning of your question. And of course, also comments are allowed and welcomed, but please be brief and to the point. Uh, maybe Vit has first question. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I have a question about, uh, actually, thinking about what Mr. Bienfest uh, said, um, wh what about contingency planning for future crises? Uh, this is something that the EU did not have in place in 2015. There was no plans. Um, and mm. this is what the US has in place. I understand those are partly uh, confidential uh, plans, but they have it, and perhaps other countries. Um, is there a chance for the EU to use um, the, the current momentum to, uh, to create those contingency plans, not only at the member state level, but at the EU level? Thank you. Thank you. We can collect uh, a few more. Yes, in the back. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie Patel. Um, looking a bit further ahead, uh, we're seeing two things kind of happening which should, uh, I think, also already form part of our thinking process because I think we come to these things rather late, too late in the day. One of them is the demographic changes inside the EU, and the second is the impact of climate change on, on, the, on the global south, um, both of which, I guess, will have a push and a pull effect to continuing mi migratory um, flows into the EU. Is that something that we can better prepare for, knowing that it's, there's a high likelihood of those, those things happening, or are we still going to continue in this crisis mode um, that, we've, that we've seen over the past few years. Okay, last one, and then I will come back to the, the lady maybe here, mm -hmm. the first row. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Chrysanthemus Kornacki. I'm formerly of the European Commission, now with the Union Syndical Trade Union. Um, I was uh, very glad to hear uh, Mr. Park's intervention. Uh, I uh, couldn't help but feeling that the uh, uh, <coughs> description of logistics as stopgap measures, I <coughs> was interested in a deeper analysis of the migration issue. Um, you talked about local uh, labor markets. Um, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, working conditions there are execrable, and I'm sure you will agree with that. So before sending uh, migrant workers there, um, should we not put pressure in... Um, improving things. Um, furthermore, uh, we know um, African countries are not democracies. They are oligarchies, uh, mostly. Um, uh, for example, um, the Central African franc is the same as the West African franc. However, uh, you need to change one from uh, two towards the other. They are uh, both locked towards the euro as they used to be towards the French franc. Um, these countries don't have the power to devalue their currency and create their own economic policy. Uh, we know that European companies flood local markets with cheap products and put local producers out of business. Sometimes also charities or European charities do that. Uh, I would be interested to hear a more, a deeper analysis of the causes of migration. People leave not because they like it, but because they have to. And economic migrants, it's not, uh, it's not a luxury thing. Oh, they're just economic migrants. Let's send them back. Uh, they are in, in dire need. So I'd like to hear something deeper, okay. if, you, if I may. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go back to the panel. Who wants to start? Francois, you have a specific okay. question. <laughs> okay, but I will start with the, not the specific okay. question, but with the question on uh, demography and climate change. The reason why I'm talking about it is because I was attending last week, there was a very interesting conference organized in Brussels exactly on that topic. Uh, and there's been a very interesting book of 600 pages showing scenarios for the future in immigration in the world and including in Europe. So I suggest to try to have access to this. It, it's publicly available. It's uh, published by the GRC. I don't know exactly. It's an EU 
body, but I don't know exactly what it what it's uh, what the initials are for. But what I remember for uh, the main message there was to say that you cannot have a simplistic way of uh, analyzing the demographic needs by saying uh, there is a lack of so many, and so you uh, and because the aging of the population and everything, so you need so many migrants to compensate. The main message there was to say. Uh, you can have different policies to address the issue of uh, diminution, dim, uh, diminution of, um, of people in the countries. And for instance, by changing your policies, your gender policies, by uh, allowing more access to uh, the work for women, like for instance Sweden does, uh, by doing those policies, in fact, you will diminish the need <coughs> that you would have from migrants. I'm not saying I'm in favor of this or of that, but I'm just saying it's interesting to have a more subtle uh, approach to, to uh, demography. And as well, there was, there was some specialists on climate change and, and the movement of population due to climate change. And I was very surprised to hear that they were not at all so uh, concerned about the big flaws which would follow the climate changes, because they were saying that uh, it can go in both directions. Climate changes can have push and pull effects at the same time. Okay, I will not go into detail again. I'm not a specialist, but again, it's very interesting to, uh, to dig deeper to have a, a more precise views on, on, on those concepts. And about uh, contingency, uh, contingency plannings for future crisis, of course, the EU should prepare them. them. Again, I'm talking for EASO, so we are not a policy maker. We are just implementing the, the EU uh, decisions. But for instance, following the, uh, the model of the hotspots, the Commission has produced already some documents on how to improve the system for the future and for future crises. How can we be more efficient? How can we have this collaboration in place much faster, defining very precisely the role of each stakeholders, procedures, etc. So yes, uh, the EU intends and has, has started to, to prepare for the future. Again, as I said before, we can certainly not exclude that in the future there will be, again, in some moment, higher arrivals of people. But the question will be to see if we can call that at that moment crisis or if we are ready to, to manage, manage those situations uh, better. Thank you. Federico, maybe? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I think maybe I'll start with the last one, which um, it's a fantastic question. I can't answer it. But um, I think what you're asking is exactly on point. I mean, fundamentally, we're talking about inequalities. And... We're talking about inequalities in a, in a world where everybody now knows that there are inequalities and that somebody on the other side of the country or on the other side of the city has an $800 phone and I don't even have potable water or electricity all day. So we have these in all of the dimensions. We have them within cities, within countries, intra-regionally and intercontinentally, and that's all of this is driving migration. And we have them within our own societies as well. We, you know, the OECD countries or the industrialized countries or whatever we want to group them as are not immune to any of this, which I think is also what we're seeing very much in terms of uh, the political changes that we're observing and the, the way that people are voting all over, all over the world for, for change in different ways. So s obviously something is not working. Um, even though there's more wealth being generated, I think maybe the way it's being distributed is not, uh, it worked for a long time and it may not be working anymore. We really need to look at some of the issues that you've raised in terms of uh, basically spreading prosperity to other regions trade barriers, I think, is critical. I mean, no, we don't talk about the fact that uh, we're subsidizing tomato growers in Europe uh, while we have Ghanaian tomato farmers moving to Italy to pick tomatoes when they were farming them in Ghana before. It's ridiculous. Um, and then we can them here and ship them there. So it's all a balance. And you have to, we can't have everything. We can't have no immigration, all the wealth, fences to keep us in. They're not coming to get us. Um, so 
I don't, I don't, this is, again, I don't have the answer, but clearly the, the prosperity to other pockets of the world in a more balanced and equitable way is fundamental. We can't have the degree and level of poverty that we have in some parts that we have right now. The countries, the Western African countries that are uh, moving intra-regionally and that we're seeing in Italy are basically a collection of the poorest third of the countries in the world. Niger is second or last, second last or last, depending on when, what index you look at. And even the stars of West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, and Senegal, are at the very far end of the human development index. So that needs to, that's, need, that needs to that, that's going to change, and we need to help that we need to help that change, I think. That's directly related to the demographic uh, issue, I think, um, and of course, particular pressure that some of these countries are under related to climate change. Demographics and, demographics and migration, I think, is probably one of the most frustrating areas because um, we know the numbers. We kn the, the Commission has fantastic papers on projections of um, population growth, population decline, labor market needs, and so on. But I, I don't know who reads them. Um, certainly policymakers aren't paying attention to these papers, and nobody's making policy that's looking out even five years, never mind 15, 20, or 30 years. Um, and I think that's where migration really needs to be integrated more comprehensively into uh, economic and development policy. And when I say that, I'm not talking about telling Tunisia how to do it, but start practicing also what we preach to the Tunisians. Um, and then the third one on um, contingency planning. I'm not aware of any uh, uh, comprehensive contingency plan. Um, I know that there was discussion about uh, contingency planning in some of the southern European countries a few years ago. But I think that um, as soon as the pressure subsides, then the attention uh, moves on to some, some, somewhere else. I also think that it would be in the current situation, um, given that we have seen more or less what countries can handle um, I think these kinds of flows are, for example, to Italy, they're manageable, and Italy's quite open about being able to handle 150 to 200,000 a year. I think that their point is, if we get be beyond that, we can't do it alone, so we need the help of other EU member states. And if EU members, other EU member states aren't showing up at the table, there's not a lot that the frontline states can do on their own beyond a certain uh, level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Roderick? Um, Please be brief, because I know that the question was uh, a yeah, tough one. <laughs> no, you don't. You know, kick me if I go on too long. On, on the contingency plans. <laughs> oh, right. Um, on the contingency plans, what, what I want to get my hands on, but never will, is Frontex's vulnerability assessments. Um, uh, so this is... This is a separate exercise than, than the Schengen evaluations, and they go to the member states and they say give us a risk analysis that you're looking at, you know, what you think flows might look like. And it's an annual exercise, so, you know, in the course of the year. Tell us where you foresee problems, lack of assets, corruption, whatever it may be, and then take us through a scenario that we set to you. On day one, a fire breaks out in a detention centre. On day two, it, et cetera, et cetera. The trouble is that that's incredibly sensitive information, of course. So Frontex has said to each of, of the states, you know, we will do this bilaterally and we won't share the information. But that does mean that Frontex is sitting on an overall assessment, more or less, of what our vulnerabilities are and need to find a means of then creating a, an EU-wide contingency plan. So maybe think tanks or whatever it may be may be able to step in and say, you know, we have a clever way of helping you do that without compromising the information that the member states are giving. Second little point on that, sorry. The second little point on that, that we, we sort of fetishized um, early warning systems uh, in the crisis, and I, I, I would say they're a nonsense. Um, sort of early warning 
mechanisms and, and systems. We sat around a lot in, in my think tank thinking, God, where does the next flow come from? You don't know. It's impossible to guess. What you need to do is instead of sort of second guessing the future, is get out there and define the future. You know, put pressure on your neighbours to reform, push for controls, and then suddenly, you know, these unpredictable migration flows magically become predictable. Um, that also includes putting pressure on organisations like World Food Programme, which made a lot of noise about if you don't give us cash, then you know people are going to start coming from from Jordan and Lebanon. Oh look, they've come from Jordan and Lebanon. You know that you know you should have funded us. No, the people who came in in 2015, 2016 came from the north of Syria direct when the fighting moved northwards. Um, you know, so we need to be tough on that as well. Don't don't leave your sort of early warning system open to political blackmail like that. I'm really sorry. I will I will be I will be quick. Demography very quickly entirely agree with what Francois said. You're not paying attention anyway. Never mind. Um, it's very tempting to look at um, you know the old thing of re replacement migration. We're getting older and shrinking. Other other parts of the world have growing economies. Um, it does, I don't think it will work like that from the European side. Politically, as your population grows older, it tends to become much more hostile to, to migration and to change. And in terms of, of the growth of um, populations abroad, I'd, I'd sort of add a slightly different dimension to what Francois said. It's, it's the idea of trap populations. You know, as, as climate change happens, it's going to hit large urban centers. They tend to be near coastal areas, Rather than being able to flee, it will be people who've who've recently moved from the countryside into the cities, who've invested in that trip. That's where they are. That's their migration. And their lives there will become more and more precarious, but they'll be trapped there. Um, so you won't necessarily see massive flows out of that area. Actually, you know, the real threat is people who are trapped in vulnerable changing environments rather than the few people who have the means and the nows to, to get out. So so it's a slightly different, you know, again, as Francois says, slightly different picture. I, we're going to have to chat in the yeah. break because I'm, I'm going to be <laughs> lynched, but I, I've, got, I've got a response to that as I'm well. I'm really, anyway, really sorry, sorry because uh, we are running out of time. So unfortunately, we need to close the discussion, but we can continue in, a, in an informal way during our closing cocktail. So I know that you had a, a question. We, you can just address it now after the panel. Um, yes. Sorry, because you don't have the microphone, so... <laughs> Health implications. We have discussed the issue with uh, the European Medical Association, and it was also suggested by uh, from the German Medical Association. Health implication of transportable disease. Okay, we have this topic for the closing cocktail and the, our informal discussion. Uh, for the moment, thank you very much to our panelists. Just uh, uh, some takeaways from today. Uh, so, of course, my, the migration challenge is a very complex issue. We touched upon a, a, number, uh, a number of elements. Uh, we also highlighted some priorities for uh, the future, like uh, adopting a an, uh, an European-wide uh, approach, uh, not forget about integration, about uh, legal channels, um, being careful when cooperating with third countries, even if, of course, uh, it is a very important aspect of the response. Uh, and uh, we know that the situation now is better, but we should not disengage because still it is a very complicated uh, topic and an issue to address. Uh, I would like to thank you again, uh, all the speakers and the audience for being here and the Martin Center and all the foundations involved in, the, in this event. And please now join us for the closing cocktail outside. Thank you. Thank you.